going to talk about friendship. Who would like to have good friends? Yeah. Yes, do you have any good friends? Yeah. Yeah. So give me a name of a good friend. Give me a name. Anybody got a name of a good Mark. friend? Mark? Okay, spouses are taken for granted for now. So anybody other than your spouse? Yes. Lizelle. Lizelle is a good friend. Excellent. Who else is a good friend? Joe. Joe is a very good friend. Yes. Sharon. Sharon. Excellent. Obi. Obi is a good friend. Ah. A good one to have when you're uh, uh, in, in a dark alley as well, I would think. You know, his presence, and you, you definitely want him around you, wouldn't you? He'd be a good friend to have when you are under attack. Uh, any other good friends? We've got some good friends. Yes, in the back? Sharon. Sharon. Sharon's coming up twice now. Sharon's a different Oh, t t a different Sharon. Okay, excellent. TJ. TJ's a good friend. Far distant, but still, you know, in the heart, right? Doesn't matter the distance when you've got a good friend. Yeah, a couple more? Tony and Kobe. Tony? Tony and uh, Dennis. And Dennis, a person you couldn't remember the name of, is, <laughs> is, is a very good friend. Yeah, okay. No, we'll, we'll, we'll take it. We'll take it. Dennis. Tim and Dan. Uh, uh, sorry? Tim and Dan. Okay, Tim and Dan. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So, isn't it great to have friends? When you grew up, did you have a lot of good friends? Yeah. I, I remember I, Tim and I had very different upbringings because he had always had a really good best friend at school and I was the lonely boy playing with the fat kids in the corner of the playground, playing marbles with the fat kids. That, that, was, that was me as a child. Yes, you can feel sorry for me if you like. I, I, I don't know. But uh, my, my, my thing today is for John chapter 15, what we see is that Jesus calls us his friends. Will we allow him to make us his friends? Will we let him be our friend? Yes, our Lord. Yes, an amazing miracle work. Yes, powerful. Yes, our Savior. But will we let him be our friend? Will we let him befriend us? Whether you're uh, someone who, who has a lot of faith in Jesus, or whether you're not sure about that, or perhaps one of the teenagers, you're not yet sure if you really want Jesus to be your friend or not, my, my, my thing today is I want to urge us to let Jesus befriend us. Let Jesus be our friend because that is what he wants. I mean, it, we all need a friend and we need a friend uh, like Jesus. But this is at some point going to bounce off something and work. Maybe not. Next slide then. Go on. Let's go to the next one. Okay. You know, it's a sad thing when someone is looking for a friend. Oh, what a picture. We all need friendship. We were all designed for friendship. Even the most lonely amongst us, even the one of us who most likes our own company, even those of us who are introverts, we all are designed for friendship. I'm going to keep trying this because you never know. No? Okay. It's too far. It's too far. So, here at the very beginning, right, in Genesis, what does it say? It says that the Lord God said, and this is God speaking so he knows what he's talking about, he said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. There's a lot of theology in that. But the bottom line is, it wasn't good for man to be alone. He needed a friend. And the woman was created, at least in part, to be that man's friend. And we know that the woman also needs the man to be her friend too, right? It goes both ways. It's not good. And you and I know, those of us who are men, or have seen groups of men spend too much time alone, or people, men, to spend too much time alone, how weird we get when we're men and we spend too much time on our own. We really need companionship to round us out and make us uh, human. So uh, we were designed to be people who give friendship and receive friendship. How is our friendship today? What's really going on? Now, let me go on to the next slide. I want to tell you about a few of my friends. You've heard a few friends here. My first real friend at school was a friend called Chris Graves. Here he is. Um, well, he didn't look like that when we were at school. Um, but uh, this is him today. He's a professor of something at Cardiff University, I think, these days. A very bright chap. And he, be he became my friend at school. And, uh, and I really appreciated his friendship because he didn't care what anybody thought of him. And I was one of these people who really wanted people to like me. He just didn't care. And I admired that courage in him. He had a Christian faith, and he's one of the reasons why I'm a Christian today, because he stood up for his Christian faith at school as a 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18-year-old. We were at school together for seven years. Um, and, and he just was uh, completely unashamed of his Christian faith. We had school assemblies at a boys' school. You've got to think about this. About 600 boys in an, in a, in a, in an assembly. 
and he stands up, and occasionally one of the pupils was allowed to do the, uh, the assembly. And he would stand up and talk about his faith, and he talked about homosexuality and all what the Bible said about it. I mean, in a boys' school, with, I mean, people were laughing at him. People were sniggering behind his back. But, you know, I, I was proud to be his friend. Someone who had the courage of his convictions, and uh, I very much appreciate Chris very much. Uh, next slide. Another good friend of mine is called Lawrence. Lawrence is there on the right there. This is the day of my wedding, in case you don't recognize me there, my younger self. Um, and uh, this is Lawrence on the other side. Now, he was my best friend at university, and he's an amazing musician. I've talked about him before on one or two occasions. He's not been well recently. And he introduced me to a whole new world. His family come from Hungary, and he took me back to his family's home in North Wales, and his mother cooked me Hungarian food. I mean, astonishing paprika potatoes and all kinds of things, wonderful things. He introduced me to theatre. His father was a theatre director in North Wales. Uh, he introduced me to all kinds of music I wouldn't have otherwise listened to. And he was somebody that I learned to love, because when we first met, in a seminar at university, I said something, he contradicted it, and the, the, le the seminar leader agreed with him and not with me. And, uh, and, and so I decided I hated him. <laughs> Even though he was actually right. But uh, it's something you do with impressionist music, which won't, I won't bore you with. But uh, I, I bet, uh, after a little while, I realized, actually, he's a really nice guy. Actually, he's a really interesting guy. And we ended up becoming best friends. Uh, we need those relationships. Next slide. Uh, another friend of mine. So on the far left, next to the end, and on the far end there, on the on your left is my brother-in-law, Bill, Penny's uh, brother. Next to him is Chris McGrath. Some of you will know Chris. Again, many years ago. And Chris McGrath was the one who befriended me when I first came to church and taught me the Bible. And more than just teaching me the Bible and what it meant to be a disciple, he showed me it was possible to be a Christian and have fun. I mean, my impression of being a Christian was, you know, earnest endeavor. Grit your teeth against the world, force yourself, force the sins down, and, you know, just sacrifice for Jesus. And this was my impression of the Christian faith. And he was like, actually, well, okay, but we, we can actually enjoy ourselves. Let's go and play tennis. And I was like, really? Christians play tennis? I thought we just prayed and fasted and stuff like that, right? So now let's go and play some tennis. And we, that's what we used to do when I was studying the Bible. And he, he showed me, you can have fun. Life is meant to, it's got a lot of pleasures and joys in it that God has given me. I needed that friend in my life at that time. Next slide. Let me introduce you to the Heinz family, uh, a photograph from some years ago. Um, and that's, a, if some of you know Killian Heinz, uh, that's Killian on the right there uh, when he was much younger. Charlie Hines and I got to know each other about 1990 or thereabouts, and Charlie taught me as a friend the value of unconditional love. He's somebody who just loves people because he just loves them. You don't really have to do anything to earn his love. Even now, we don't speak very often. He's over in Ireland, but his, his son Killian told me, he said, you know, my dad still thinks you're his best friend, and we don't talk much, we watch much more than about once a year. But there's something about the connection that we have that's lasted, and he taught me how to love unconditionally. I uh, really appreciate Charlie. Next slide. Uh, Somebody who's in my life at the moment, you may not, the picture's isn't terribly clear, but in the middle you see a blue-shirted uh, man. That's Danny Makinson, for those of you who don't know him. And he does most of our song leading in Watford. He was leading singing this morning in Watford. And Danny is, is, has taught me, in my friendship with him, how to be uninhibited. Danny is completely uninhibited, so he's there leading a song with the children, uh, the song about uh, deeper than a submarine, what's that children's song, God is, he's faster than a speeding plane or something, he's bigger than a, what? Come on, Alex. Okay, you've got, you, you remember, right? And, and it's just been about being, uh, he goes deeper than a submarine, and you, you hold your nose and you go down like this. And so Danny's jumping around, and the kids are looking at Danny like, you know, but he's more enthusiastic than them. And he's got this gift of being uninhibited with children and people, and he, he's just wonderfully wholehearted. And I really need that in my life, because I'm a slightly more, by nature, reserved person. So he, he's teaching me that. Next slide. And then you've got uh, Charles Olivier, that some of us will know. 
Charles is a very deep person in terms of connecting. And he teaches me how to connect. And now and again, I'm in a meeting with, with Charles and some other people, and I'll say, okay, now let's talk about this. And, he, and then he'll say, well, hang on, can we, can we first of all make sure we're okay with each other? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'm fine with everybody, let's move on. He said, well, let's make sure we're, we're connected. Okay, all right. But I, I need that because I can just, you know, keep moving and not, not be connected as a friend. And he shows me and teaches me how to be uh, connected. And then finally, before we go on, one lot more slide, of course, my lovely wife. And to tell you all the things that I've learned about friendship from her would take a, a, a three more sermons. I can't, I mean, you know, having been married over 30 years now, there's so many things I've learned and I appreciate about her friendship with me, and of course, when, and some of us have been married a while, when you've been married a while, <laughs> you begin to realize how unlovable you really are, and how amazing it is that anybody would stick around with you that long. I remember Tony and Karen did this part of a marriage class, was it last year, and I, there was this phrase that Karen shared, that stuck in my mind, you know, when you've been married for a while, you know how each other smell, and I thought, <laughs> yeah. That's not the most profound thing we, we learn about each other, but it's just, it's just you know everything. You just do. And, and still, still she loves me. My, I, don't know, I don't always smell so good, I have to say. So, if you think back in your life, think back in your life, think, think back over this year, last year, the next, last 5, 10, 15 years, you'll find some people who have been friends. And if you think about it, your life has been enriched immeasurably by the, by the friendship you've shared, by the time you've spent together, by the experiences you've had, good and bad, all teach us something, and we need those friends. And we need those friends even today. So two things I'd like to share about from John chapter 15 here, about Jesus and our friendship with him. Let's, let's actually look at the text here now. Beginning in verse 1 of, of chapter 15. Let's read this together. Jesus is saying some very important things to his followers here. In John 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. <coughs> I have told you this so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you Friends, for everything that I learned from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you 
and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. And we'll stop there. And again, yeah, there's tons in this passage and we haven't got time to look at it all. But I want to focus on this issue of friendship. Next slide, please. First of all, we've got to figure this out. If we want to be good friends with one another, if we want to have a good relationship with Jesus, we've got to understand, we've got to allow him to define friendship. We have our own definitions of friendship, our own expectations, our own experiences of friendship. But let's let Jesus define what friendship is really all about, at least certainly in terms of what it means to be a friend with him in relationship with him. Because only Jesus really knows what friendship really is. I mean, he invented us, designed us, created us, sustains us. So he is the one that understands friendship in ways that we, we obviously quite, uh, clearly uh, at this point don't yet fully understand. So three things about Jesus' style of friendship in the next slide. Three things. Jesus' style of friendship has three main characteristics. Perhaps you can find more, but these are three that I noticed. The first is initiative. Jesus took initiative. He said, it's not that you chose me, I chose you. Friendship really works when we choose to be friends with somebody. I appreciate Lawrence becoming my friend because he chose it. I appreciate Tim becoming my friend because he chose to be a friend to me. When we lived in Manchester and Tim and Chevy lived in Birmingham, I used to get phone calls regularly from Tim, who I didn't really know very well. I mean, I'd met him, I knew who he was, I knew he was a Christian, so I guess he was okay. But he, he'd ring me up. He ring me up and say, hello, Malcolm, how are you? And I'm like, well, I'm fine, thanks very much. Uh, what's, what's up? <laughs> oh, nothing, I just like ring you, you know, and chat. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, well, how's, how's Birmingham? Well, it's, uh, you know, whatever. And, and we, he ramble on about stuff, <laughs> life and things, and, and ask about my children and my wife and all kinds of things. And I, I put the phone down at the end of the phone call and think, well, that was very nice, but a bit strange. And uh, I, there didn't seem to be any reason for him to ring me. I mean, you know, normally when people ring you, they've got something they need. At least that's my way of, you know, my natural way of living. And so <clears throat> Tim uh, uh, took that initiative. And this is Jesus. Let's face it, none of us would be here unless Jesus had taken the initiative with us. He came to earth of his own volition, at the Father's will, but, but willingly coming to earth for our benefit, not for his own. He takes initiative. He chooses us. And the second thing is investment. Jesus has invested loads of time with his disciples and he has invested loads of time with us. He spent at least three years with his disciples up to this point, maybe three and a half perhaps. That's a lot of time walking day in, day out, day by day, week by week, month by month for three years. It's a lot of time. He spent a lot of time making disciples and making disciple makers and making friends of the disciples and disciple makers. This is, this is us. This is our lives. I mean, it, we are people who befriend others. And frankly, you know, in some ways we don't have an agenda, and in some ways we do. I mean, I think we should have indiscriminate friendship on one level because we should just be friendly and love people. But on the other hand, we do have a calling from God to make disciples of Jesus, to introduce them to our friend Jesus so they can follow him and so they can help others follow him. So there's kind of an agenda and a kind of isn't. And I, I think we need to be a little careful with this idea of we should never have an agenda when making friends. I, I'm not so sure about that. I think the point is we're not meant to be manipulative or deceitful. But I can't help but have an agenda when I'm making a friend, a friend because I'd like them to meet my friend Jesus. So it depends how you define the word agenda and all that kind of thing. And I, I don't want to get too much into that now. But, I, but this is how Jesus lived. He lived so that people would know the Father. And his friends came to know the Father through him. And that was a wonderful thing. And, and that's us too. We invest in our friendships. Jesus did that. And then thirdly, his friendship was innocent, by which I mean it was genuine. It was a genuine love. It wasn't for his own benefit. He served his friends. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. He, uh, he, he washed the feet of the disciples. In fact, can we go to that next slide? He washed their feet earlier in John chapter 13. And he says here in chapter 15, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for his friends. He gained nothing from going to the cross. But he did give us what we needed. 
last Sunday in Watford in the church where up there uh, the communion was shared by Barry Edwards who some of you might know he was here briefly in Thames Valley for a few months Barry and Kate and Barry did the communion and for his communion he, uh, he got up and he said I need a volunteer so of course when that happens in church everybody looks at each other or at the floor um, anyway eventually Tunde one of our members came up and he sat at the front and, uh, uh, and he got him to sit at the front and then Barry pulled out a bowl and a towel and some, some soap and he had the text of, of John 13 uh, printed out and he put it there and then he read out that whole thing from John 13 whilst washing Tunde's feet and I could hear people crying and my wife said that's the best communion I've ever seen I mean it was deeply moving to see Barry do that for Tunde, and you could see Tunde, we're all looking at Tunde too, and Tunde looked kind of uh, touched and very embarrassed all at the same <laughs> time as any of us would, and I, I've had people wash my feet, it's a very humbling experience, you may have had, I don't know, the point is not so much the act, but the point is more that humbling oneself, Barry on his knees on the floor, doing that for Tunde, Jesus, all the more, Jesus, Son of God, divine, kneeling, washing, Filthy disciples, feet showing his his love, taking the initiative, investing the time, and being innocent in that offer of friendship, just a pouring out of himself for his friends. Jesus defines friendship. If you're like me, some of you, some of you are probably naturally friend type, friendly people, and and well done. That's really good for you. But perhaps some of you are, are, are like me, where you find friendship really mysterious. I really don't understand it. It's like a foreign language, and I, I don't get it. And I wonder, for some of us, whether we don't have good friendships with Jesus, we don't feel like he's a friend, or we don't, or we don't feel we make, we make good friends generally, simply because we, we've stopped trying to learn about friendship from the Master, from Jesus. Perhaps... If we did these three things, just did those, these three things and the, in the strength of God with prayer, to take the initiative and not wait for people to befriend us, to invest the time and to be innocent in our offer of friendship in serving other people, perhaps we would firstly learn how to be a friend, but secondly find ourselves an effective friend, and thirdly find ourselves to be one who has friends and be able to offer friendship to other people. So our first point is that Jesus defines friendship. Secondly, moving on, um, what does it mean to live in friendship with Jesus? What does that really mean for you and I today who wish to follow Jesus and want to be his friend? What does it, what does it actually mean? And so let me offer some ideas from this next slide. The word that's translated remain in John chapter 15 is the Greek word meno, or meno, which can mean a number of different things. It can mean to stay, to continue, to dwell, to lodge, to remain, to rest, to settle, to endure, to continue unchanged, to persevere, to be constant, steadfast, to indwell, and to abide. So what you might want to do for your own personal devotional time is read through John 15, putting one of these words in where every, each time it talks about abiding in Christ or remaining in Christ, and see what insights that might give you as to what it might look like then to abide in Christ, to remain in Christ, to dwell in Christ, to lodge in Christ. What does that mean? Pray through that. It's just an idea for your own personal Bible study and prayer times, because the word means more than just the one word we have here in, in our English translations. But also on the next slide, I'd like to bring your attention to this phrase, which I rather like, was one, one way of translating this. It can mean to be in close and settled union. To remain in Christ, to abide in Christ, as it says in John 15, can mean to be in close and settled union. And I think what's going on here is we're learning that to abide in Christ means to be loyal to him. It means to be allegiant to him, that we've decided he is my friend. I mean, I know we've, through life we sometimes lose friends, or we lose the closeness of them because people move or things happen, and ultimately some, you know, people die, and so we lose friends. But, but what Jesus is saying is, I am your faithful friend that you've got to hold on to through the whole of your life. There's an allegiance, a loyalty, 
uh, towards him that is beyond our loyalty and allegiance to any other person, any other friend. There's something deeper about this, something about our loyalty to him, which is more powerful than any other relationship. Let's go on to the next slide. If this is what it means, then I would suggest that there are three things for us to think about in terms of living in friendship with Jesus. What does it mean? First of all, time. It means time. It means if we want to live in friendship with Jesus, that we enjoy spending time with him. We enjoy spending time with him. And if we as people here don't find ourselves enjoying spending time with Jesus, then my suggestion is that's the thing to fix. That's the thing to figure out, why don't I enjoy spending time with Jesus? Whether it's in in reading his word or prayer or just just thinking about him and talking to him and and reflecting on him. Why might we not want to do that? That, That's the thing to think about rather than just, well, it's a problem and I'm going to ignore it. We like spending time with him. Um, An article Chris Bertel sent me last year, which I dug back up. Uh, from the, I think it was the Daily Telegraph. Uh, did they, did some kind of survey was done and some, some psychological research was done on friendship. And what they suggest is that people who have real friends, like a real friend, you need to spend about, to develop it, to be, call it a real friendship, you need to spend about 90 hours with that person. Now, I don't know whether to you that sounds like a lot or not very much. That depends probably on our personality, I would guess. To me, it sounds like a lot. 90 hours, that's, that's a lot of time with somebody. That's, that's, that's what it takes, though. It takes time to build a real, genuine friendship. This is why our times with God, in a focused way, what we call our devotional times or our quiet times, these are so important because this is us saying, I want to spend time with you, God, with you, Jesus. I want to get to know you. I need this time. Maybe it's not just 90 hours. Let's face it, um, God is so vast and enormous and huge and complex and deep that there's, there's always more to learn. There's always more to uncover. But it takes, does take time. And what, the, what they suggested is that these three uh, things are significant in friendship. Spark, proximity, and time. The spark is that kind of connection. That, oh, that, you're interesting. You're an interesting person. I'd like to know you better. The proximity is actually being together because only when you're together do you really know somebody. You can't really know them through a Skype conversation. You've got to walk through some life together, right? And then there's just time, which again, Jesus demonstrated this with his disciples. And this is what helps us to get close to Jesus, to be a friend with Jesus, is to recognize the spark, which we we wouldn't be here unless there was some spark, something special about Jesus, but also that proximity. Spending time together, walking through life together. Next slide. It takes time, but it also takes trust. Walking in friendship through life with Jesus takes trust, trusting him. And of course, what Jesus is doing in John 13, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, is he's showing his disciples and teaching them the reasons they can trust him and how to trust him. And that's one of the good reasons for studying these chapters. Trust. In other words, in um, willingly absorbing and living out his priorities rather than our own. Trusting him for the way of life. Trusting him to live like a disciple of Jesus Christ. Living with different priorities from the world. Trusting him for the way to live. Trusting him for our doctrine and our beliefs. What we, what we take from the Bible. It's not necessarily what's convenient or what people like or even we, are, we like. But it's about what Jesus says. Our priorities are important. We are free but we're spiritual with our choices, right? And those choices we make with it, the way we use our time and our money and our energy, are shaped by our friend Jesus. What would he do with our time and energy and money is a key question for us to ask. We trust him in the context of John 15 when pruning takes place, when life is tough or when things don't go the way we wanted them to go. We don't get that job. We don't, our children don't achieve this, that and the other. Um, our wife won't do what we want her to do, which we know is right, but never mind. Um, when, when, when the boss is not fair, when the in-laws don't treat you right, when financially things are not what you wish them to be. I mean, when life is not fair, fair. That's, that's part of what pruning is about and it, it does refine us and we need to trust Jesus. That's part of living 
in the friendship of Jesus. We do have enough help to get us through those times. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, uh, No temptation to see you except what is common to man, but God will provide a way out so you can stand up under it. God will give you the strength. And again, that's a large part of the message of John 15 and following. It's about the Holy Spirit being our strength, our guide, our supporter through the tough times. But we don't stop trusting that Jesus has our best interests at heart. Because a good friend always has your best interests at heart. And Jesus certainly has that. He's committed to us. So we trust him and we trust his promises. And thirdly, uh, moving on to the next slide, um, friendship, living in friendship with Jesus involves telling. So time, trust and telling. And what that telling is, it's about telling other people about him. When you've got a great friend, don't you like to introduce your other friends to that friend? Or people you meet that are, are relative strangers, you like them to meet that special friend, right? And... Uh, I was at dinner last night with some neighbours. Penny and I got to know some neighbours who moved in there nearby. And we went to their place for dinner last night. And we're having a really nice dinner. And the conversation turned to drawings. Because they have a teenage daughter, Samantha, who's maybe 15, doing some GCSEs. And she's doing art and design. And she, she showed us some drawings. And they're really good. And they were all of cars. Really good drawings of sports cars. All sports cars. So we're chatting away. It turns out she's a 15-year-old petrol head. And her, her main aim in life is to, is to buy a Mustang. That, that's all she really, as long as she can buy a Mustang at some point in life, she'll be totally happy. <laughs> so we're talking about muscle cars for the rest of the, uh, for the last part of the evening. And so I, I was said, what? And then and, 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 uh, Formula One came up. And so I said, oh, I have a chap I know who works for McLaren. You should have seen the look on her face. <laughs> I mentioned Jaunty working at McLaren. She's like, oh. I, mean, so I thought she was going to faint. She couldn't get the words out. She's so excited. And I thought, I'm, well, I, I've got up in the world in her mind. I have a friend who works at McLaren. I mean, I get, I get reflected glory from John T. Just from the fact that I actually know him. Uh, see if we can connect you up at some point to meet my friend who works at McLaren. Uh, it's when, when you've got a friend who's special, you want the other people. To, to know, and, and who is more special in our lives than Jesus? Honestly, who's more special than our friend Jesus? Evangelism is inviting friends or strangers into a friendship with our best friend, Jesus. Invite people to church by all means. Invite people to sit and have a coffee and talk. Invite people to come to whatever things. That's, that's fine. But, but what's really going on? We think we have an astonishing friend, the best friend anybody could ever have. And we'd like people to meet that friend. Doesn't that take the pressure off? Isn't that simpler? It's about a relationship. It's not about a religion. It's, it's about a person, not about a doctrine. It's about something to do with the heart, not to do with Anything else? Mm -hmm. Living in friendship with Jesus, walking in friendship with Jesus means we invest time with him, we want to spend time with him. It means that we trust him for his priorities and it means we, we tell others about him. I've got a couple of thoughts just to finish off, but I'm going to ask Paige to come up at this point and read a poem she's written about Jesus that I think fits well with this. So do you want to come up, Paige? Please close your eyes. So in John 15, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. How do you define the vine? Jesus, our perfect vine. Perfection, lush, filled with life, bright, Exuding light like no other, teeming with life, strong enough to keep us safe, wise enough to direct our steps. Perfection, overflowing with love, love unable to fail us. In him we grow and thrive, transformed into his likeness. As a branch, I receive nourishment. 
I am protected. I am loved. I thrive and grow. I am connected to true life and glorious light. I can rely on this vine and remain in it for the rest of my days. It's a beautiful vine. What a fruitful vine, filled with life and enabling us, its branches, to stay alive, to grow and to bear fruit. It is a luscious vine, soaked in colors, bright, bold and beautiful, filled with precious stones. Living vine, keep me grafted into you. In you I find life and remain alive. In you I find meaning and purpose. In you I find safety and protection, direction, correction, and connection. You are a love-filled vine, drawing others in, pruning others to help them bear more fruit. What a magnificent vine. What a huge vine. Nothing compares to you. I run here and I run there for life, but in you is life eternal. Staying connected to you keeps me beautiful, lush, radiant, bright, full of light. In this vine, Jesus, I am purified, beautified, supervised, edified, dignified. I am nourished. I flourish. No longer do I perish. The secret of the vine is in the keeper of the vine. Thank you. I think a round of applause is uh, appropriate. Wow, yeah. that's super. Thank you very much, PG. Just imagine, just to finish on, just imagine in that last slide, just imagine that uh, we are a community where friendship predominates, where the friendships of, friendship like Jesus has for us, that, that kind of quality of friendship is what characterizes our relationships here. What a community this will be as we develop more and more of that. Imagine the, the impact on the world of us showing Christ-like friendships to the world and making friends and telling people about our amazing Jesus. We have an incredible opportunity to share about our best friend with the world that so much needs to know this friend. Take care.